Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Today, let's spotlight Davidson's well-strung guitars. It's like a year or two ago, I started seeing this show up on reverb listings. It's like, okay, that's a catchy name. I get what you're going for there, guys. But they kept posting such amazing things, and then it's like, oh, it's the guys behind the Songbirds Guitar Museum. Okay. Now, just in case you haven't heard of Songbirds before, as far as I'm aware, they're no longer open. However, it was this really cool guitar museum that you could go to down in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So I thought today we'd just check out some of the more interesting ones that they're actually willing to sell. So you can visit their website to see everything that they are selling. However, there's also some Instagram exclusive deals, like you have to know they're selling it there to find the really rare guitar, so I think I'm going to split this episode into two. So the first one that caught my attention, a 1968 Gibson Les Paul Gold Top. In case you don't know, after the original Les Paul model was discontinued in 1961, they didn't bring it back until 68. The very earliest ones produced had this crown on the headstock, due to essentially a typo in their spec sheet. So for me, an original crown headstock 68 is definitely on my bucket list, but usually what ends up showing up is really beat up, not that nice. But then you have a nice example like this one. Sure, it's got a little bit of belt rash, you've got some nicks and dings, but it looks like the headstock is free from brakes, cracks, and repairs, you might even have a little bit of flame figuring in that mahogany. This looks like a pretty darn good example, right? Even with a little bit of the black missing on the headstock. The top is good, it displays well. You can bet your butt one day I'll have one of these in my own museum. Because it's got that perfect blend of, you know, quirky spec and super historical. But how much is theirs? Uh, unfortunately, they don't list pricing. You have to call them to find out. Next up, we have a custom color ES330 TD. Generally, I wouldn't be all that interested in purchasing a vintage 330. But a custom color Inverness green? Yes, I am all over that. That finish looks so good with the chrome P90 pickup covers. Nylon saddles and all, you just don't see the green finish within Gibson's catalog very often, especially on an original 60s model. Typically, the best you get is an aged Pelham blue. Which, I don't know, L looking at the back of this neck here, it almost looks like that might be the case. But either way, really cool custom color. But next, a true Pelham Blue 1966 Gibson SG Standard. Pelham Blue SGs are just so fantastic, but when you can find a vintage original one having that color, that's such a rare treat. Yeah, I would like to own it, but to be honest guys, 50s and 60s models don't really interest me that much as far as owning because there's so much else I would rather own before dumping all that money on something that old. I mean, I get it. These are the original models, but if I can get some weird 70s SG exclusive for 5,000 bucks versus dropping 40 grand on this, I I'd rather have six interesting guitars that I like versus the original. Now this one, the finish, you can definitely tell it was Pelham Blue because it's not completely uniformly aged. I mean, this one's definitely been played. Any place where the clear coat lacquer has been worn off a bit or doesn't see as much sunlight, you still see that blue. Which this one was definitely played. You've got some wear through to the bare mahogany, some buckle worming. It's interesting that they comment that it's difficult to tell between Inverness or Pelham because underneath the pick guard, the finish is green. I mean, to be fair, this is what Inverness is supposed to look like as far as a custom shop goes. And then this is like a true Pelham blue before it's aged. It can probably get difficult. But that neck certainly looks very Pelhamish to me. Kind of similar to our other 330, this is one that doesn't have F holes. Weird oddities like these always excite me because it's like, yeah, I've got a 330, but it doesn't have F holes. <laughs> Everything else is what you would expect it to be, but you know, it kind of gets BB King vibes before the Lucille model was a signature guitar that was publicly available anyway. And the other thing about vintage custom orders is there's usually always a pretty good story behind it. Like a musician ordered it this way for a reason. Nowadays, custom orders are usually a collector ordered it a specific way for it to look like this. Or it could also still be the whole musician thing. But let's face it, the custom prices of instruments mainly lend themselves to collectors or just people who appreciate guitars for guitars. But hey, wouldn't it be cool if we do a semi-hollow guitar, but instead of the F-holes on the front, they're on the back for some strange reason? Or like engrave them only on the side. I know Gibson's G series has the whole sound port on the side, but what if we have an actual F-shaped one on the edge? Just to make a weird strange limited edition, but no, this one's actually looking pretty clean on the back. Next up is the guitar that first put these guys on my radar. A green burst late 60s ES335. When I first saw this, I wanted to buy it because this is everything I love. This is definitely close to the iguana burst finish that was birthed in the 2010s, but to see that, 
on a 1968. It's like, what? I mean, that's when Boring Brown was on everything. And Boring Brown's cool, don't get me wrong, but it's walnut this, walnut that, occasionally a cherry sunburst. But green? It blows your mind somebody was this forward thinking to want it on a guitar. Not only the top, but even the back. Now, sadly, not the neck, not the headstock, not the sides. That would have made it infinitely cooler. And yeah, I would have preferred a more teardrop shape, but it was probably a custom order they wanted this style. At the same time, having a transparent green mahogany neck, I bet that looks pretty darn cool in person. This is something I wouldn't mind owning. However, I did just recently document a mod collection Green Burst 335, and then once I figured out that was based on an even older vintage custom order, it kind of made me not like that late 60s one as much as I did before. Because let's face it, the darker Green Burst, at least in my opinion, looks better than the Iguana style, but maybe it'd be good to have both. Next, we have a 1974 Gibson Les Paul Custom. Hey, Trogly, why are you showing us this beautiful white Les Paul Custom? That's because it's not technically a white Les Paul Custom. They have black backs and sides. Now, I thought I was the one that came up with the name Tuxedo Custom, but let's be real here. I'm kind of young to this game. I'm sure somebody out there at some other point in time had an idea that, yeah, a white top, black back, it kind of looks like a tuxedo. But I remember when I first ran into one of these, at first I thought that's got to be a refinished top. It can't be a real thing, right? But then you find more and more of them on the used market. I mean, there were only a handful of these things, like maybe 50, 60. But occasionally you can find 20th anniversary Les Paul customs, you know, from 1974 that are done up in this finish. A famous person actually used one of these in the band Dokken. So that's kind of where their whole claim to fame is. Now, this particular one looks really clean at first, but then when you really zoom in, it's got some, I mean, in my opinion, rather ugly finished checking, but I think the ones I documented, it was refretted and all the parts have been changed. But I would like to document one of these again, and I'll definitely be keeping the next tuxedo custom I buy. Sadly, prices have gone up exponentially on these things. But that is something I definitely want in my future collection, one of every single Les Paul custom color ever offered, from at least 1976 through about 1989. After that, that's when things just get way too crazy. Like, I'll have some of the other ones, but that particular era speaks to me the most. So something like this next one, I've never seen anything like it. You've got sparkling burgundy on a custom? For me, I don't like the early 70s customs. They have terrible frets in comparison to the later 70s, but since they've got the mahogany necks, they're a little bit more vintage correct in that aspect. They fetch more money. They're also a little bit more rare. But sparkling burgundy, you would find that on like 335s, but not Les Paul customs. The thing with sparkling burgundy is they can fade out. They can age in really weird ways. This one, I mean, it's relatively unscathed. It's kind of scary. Two of our knobs may not be original on that. Could say it's just because the numbers have worn off, but hmm, somebody would have to have used that quite a bit. I mean, there's some finish checking here. And again, I'm not critiquing any of this because I don't have the guitars in person. I'm sure these guys know what they're doing, but everything else on this is looking clean. How's the back? Ah, yes, now I remember this one. So everything's like, okay, right here, maybe we have some sort of strap residue that may or may not be able to get cleaned off. But then you move up here and it's like, what? It's, it's got a golden neck. <laughs> That's a thing that sparkling burgundy does. That's what I was just talking about. Fades out and kind of turn golden. So to find one that actually looks like the modern day sparkling burgundy would be a miracle. But the way that this one has so unevenly aged on the back of the neck almost kind of gives it like a tri-burst effect. You know, you can find it on like the Player Plus Stratocasters. How it goes from red to yellow. Except for this was way before that time. Or perhaps was it custom ordered that way to begin with? This is one of those I, I wish the price was a little bit more publicized because I'm curious, what kind of a premium are they putting on this? It's like a normal custom from this era. They've been running like five to 8,000 depending on condition. Are they wanting 15? Are they wanting 25? I, I don't know. It's an interesting piece. Another one within the vintage custom color game, Cardinal Red. Everyone and their brother's mother has a cherry one, but only you have Cardinal Red. All the other ones are gonna be pretty close looking to this. I mean, they fade and they kind of turn a mahogany color, sure. And this one will always be a nice, bright, vibrant red. But is it worth paying two times as much? Probably only if you're a diehard collector, but that's why it's so cool. The fact that it does exist, that somebody brand new wanted, no, nah, I don't want to be able to see that wood grain. You better cover that up back in the 60s. Which hat knobs, 
Vibrola, all the good stuff that you like about a late 60s SG Custom, Batwing Guard all white included, cool looking headstock with the custom truss rod cover, and a back to match. That thing seems to have held up pretty well. A little bit earlier, they have a Tobacco Sunburst SG Custom. Now I have actually seen these before. Apparently there's like a handful of these out there. It's also possible that this is the same one that I've seen before, and maybe it is even more rare than I know. Because the owner of this shop is saying it's the only one he's seen, so I'm sure he's done more digging into true vintage than I have. I wish they would have done more of this rather than just all white pretty much all the time. Because the burst paint job on an SG Custom really does transform it. They experimented a little bit more with this in the 70s, but even yet today, you don't see too much of the teardrop burst shape on an SG Custom. So that makes these older vintage examples just that much cooler. But that is going to wrap it up for tonight's episode. Feel free to go to their website, wellstrungguitars.com. You won't find prices, but you will find happiness. <laughs> All right, guys, I will give you one extra talking about a guitar tonight. And it comes from their Firebird article, where they show you all the custom colors that you can find on a Firebird. Here's a good look at Pelham Blue versus the Green. But it's this guitar right here, a 1965 Firebird 1 in custom color Ember Red. But apparently during the transition period between the non-reverse and the reverse style, the Firebird 1, despite typically being a wrap tail with a Firebird mini pickup in the bridge position only, became known as a two pickup P90 with all the regular stuff, still had the normal headstock before they flipped it. Looks like we don't have binding on that, but these guys nicknamed it the Platypus, which I love. Yeah, that's a guitar I want. It it doesn't have to be in the custom color. Any format, I would be happy to document one of those. All right, Droglodytes, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.